Welcome to our next session, everybody. We are going to keep the th great thoughts and discussion going on remote and distributed work during crises. We have Gary A. Bowles here with us, who is the chair of or for the future of work here at Singularity University, uh, where he focuses on the strategies to help create a human centric future of work for individuals, organizations, communities and countries. Thank you for joining us today, Gary. It's great to be here. Well, let's uh, let's get into it. Excellent. All right. Well, good morning from San Francisco. Um, I just want to give thanks to Adam and the team for all their hard work to pull all of this off. Uh, there's so many people working behind the scenes at uh, Singularity University to make this all happen. Uh, please thank them in the chat line when you get the chance. They're doing tremendous work. Um, thanks also to Charlene uh, for providing some of the strategic overview for organizational leaders and a lot of these issues related to remote and distributed work. Um, even though she lives just a few blocks from me uh, here in San Francisco, we're maintaining our social distance. Um, so, And uh, thanks also to Aaron for giving us some thoughts around uh, virtual work. So um, I want to build on uh, these ideas by offering some thoughts about how we can all work in these uh, extraordinary times, and especially how we can uh, work with each other. Um, I, I think we've all pretty much agreed that, that there's just a big reset or pause button that's been hit. Um, you know, we know from people like Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis that we, we live in science fiction times. Um, in just the past few weeks, I think we can all be forgiven um, that we feel like we've involuntarily been cast in a dystopian movie. Uh, in a blindingly short period of time, um, this, this pause button has been hit all around the world. And you'd think that only a Hollywood scriptwriter could have envisioned a way that suddenly hundreds of millions of people would suddenly become isolated from each other almost overnight. Um, What's unique is the speed and the spread of that impact on our lives and our economies. Um, it's a sudden whack to the side of the head for a large percentage of our world. But what I don't think is unique is that we as humans have always lived through these extraordinary times, um, whether it's an earthquake or a fire as we're prone to here in the San Francisco Bay Area, or it's a flood or, or it's a war. Um, as a species, you know, we've, we've weathered these storms before. See if this sounds familiar to you. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us and we had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven or we were going directly the other way, in short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Yes, that's Charles Dickens from A Tale of Two Cities, which he wrote in 1859. Um, and I think what it shows us is that our, our current crisis un is unique, but it's also hauntingly familiar. Um, you know, as I posted last fall in my feed on LinkedIn, I said that the real test of the future of work was likely to be the next global crisis. And, and here we are. <laughs> I'm going to focus specifically on issues related to work um, and organizations, but there's also life issues, issues of our communities, our countries, our families, our friends, and our fellow citizens that I think all come to the fore when we talk about our work, and especially work in these uncertain times. So I'm going to give you some pointers on some of the things I think that each of us can do to make our distributed work more effective, but I also want to urge everyone listening, not just to think differently, but to act differently. And I'm gonna talk about how, how I approach that. And I think one of the best ways, you know, we talked a lot at, at uh, Singularity University about um, you know, what happens when, when we've got this sort of reset button on, on what we do for um, organizations and what we do in times of exponential change. Um, you know, it's, a, it's also a reset button for for work and especially for so many of us who are now distributed. And, um, and I think what we need is to think of not just the, the, um, the techniques and processes for when we suddenly find ourselves you know, separated by, by virtual distance, uh, but how we develop the, the mindset and the skill set. Um, and as a matter of fact, in any domain, this is, it's, it's this yin and yang of helping to ensure that we not only have the, 
the tools and techniques that uh, Charlene was talking about, but we also have a have a mindset shift. So um, the difference, uh, highlighting the difference that I show is, um, you know, the um, uh, if if I wave a magic wand and you have uh, suddenly we're standing at the foot of a mountain and you have all of the skill set of a mountain climber, but you look up at the top of the mountain and you say, oh no, that's that's too cold, that's too high. You're not going to climb the mountain. You have all the skill set, but none of the mindset. If I wave my magic wand again, and suddenly you have all the mindset, uh, but none of the skill set. You've never climbed a mountain before, but you look up at the, the top and you think, well, how hard could that be? And you take one step, two steps. Uh, you encounter hardships. You solve problems, but eventually you're at the top of the mountain. And you look down and you say, well, how hard could that be? So that's the mindset and skill set that I think that we need to, to focus on in this. And you know what I think of as the COVID shift. Uh, it's testing each of our ability to change, each of our ability to adapt. Um, if, you, if you like that sort of framing, then um, uh, you know, Carol Dweck, the author, talks about the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset. And there's nothing wrong with a fixed mindset. It's just that in times of exponential change, it's much, much harder to be able to continually adapt. And I think that's that's a challenge for all of us, but especially, you know, for those of us who, who have become more accustomed to work that is actually pretty consistent and pretty much the same thing day to day. And so developing that growth mindset is critical. So um, I'm going to point to a range of different resources as I go along. I've got links to all of these on my website at gbowls.com. But um, if you, you find these issues of uh, mindset and skill set important, then, then uh, Carol Dweck has a, has a great book to use as a resource. So. Um, so I think our message now is we suddenly all are finding that we're many of us are, are having to uh, work in place. Um, we have to figure out what this new skill set is. You know, what's the process that we're going to be able to do collaboration? Uh, we're going to continue to do our work as individuals. We're going to continue to collaborate. Uh, and it, it's pretty complicated. There's lots of different issues, um, especially when I, when I um, lecture and write about the future of work. Um, I did 71 talks around the world last year. Um, I try to sort of distill this down into four different domains. So I talk about individuals, organizations, communities, and countries. And so now that we're talking about distributed work, um, I think it's important to, to maybe talk about a few strategies in each of those. And then um, I want to sort of wrap up with some thoughts about um, how we can be responsive in these exponential times. And then let's make it a, a discussion. I'd love to hear your questions and uh, and thoughts. And so. Um, so let's focus first on on uh, the skill set and mindset for individuals. Um, and I, if, if we're going to distill down to sort of one basic challenge and opportunity when we're thinking about doing more work on our own, more work distributed and virtually, um, I've I've been working out of the house, uh, my home office, uh, with my wife and business partner Heidi for over 15 years. And uh, and what I find is that continually helpful to be able to. To distill down to is um, what are the problems like really become very problem centric in um, in the work that we do? How do we step back and really look at exactly the problems that we're trying to solve? And so um, I often say work is just the three things. It's a problem to be solved, whether it's a dirty floor or complex market entry strategy or the uh, designing a new product for our customers. How do we solve problems? We perform tasks and how do we perform tasks? We use our human skills. So, um, and it turns out in many organizations, uh, we, we tend to have lots of tasks and we group them together, we call them processes, and then we sort of fall in love with our processes and we forget uh, the, the problem that we're solving. And so, um, so it's important to stay very problem centric in our work and especially when suddenly we've gone through this big reset button and doing work from remote um, and distributed, how do we Think of new ways that we can build new process practices that we can continually be solving the problems. Um, and how do we how do we rethink those processes so that they're as effective as possible? Now, uh, it just so happens that um, I was uh, never all that interested in college when I was young. I sort of fell into the family business, and the family business just happened to be uh, my father was the author of a book called "What Color Is Your Parachute," which was sort of become the, the world's enduring career manual. And what he saw was a pattern of how we work um, and what, what the work environment was. And he said, well, we have these skills, you know, that we apply to human problems and our knowledges, but we also have a workplace. We've got sort of you know, the, the physical context. We've got geographical conditions where we work. 
uh, the kinds of people that we work with that we see on a regular basis. Um, and of course, then how we're compensated. And I'll talk a little bit about purpose later on. What's happened in the, you know, the COVID shift is suddenly issues related to the workplace, related to our geography, related to people that we work with have all become, as my friend John Hagel at the White Center for the Edge says, uh, unbundled. And so this is what kind of looks like in this era. We go from this sort of construct, this use case of a job, to all these different pieces sort of being exploded. And now what we used to think of as a fairly stable environment of the workplace has become uh, completely unbundled. And, uh, and the workplace, you know, the anchor for our workplace is, is for many of us is now our home. Now there's lots of people that are still in critical services that still are dealing with the public. And, but, but for the most part, we're, you know, we're finding that many of us are having to rethink the context of that, that workplace. And so um, here's one way I would suggest we sort of do that, that mindset shift and reset is uh, first off to think of ourselves as problem solvers. Um, it, uh, the, the, um, you know, in every organization, there's one or two people that think it's their job to create problems and you know exactly who those are in your company. But for the most part, we're problem solvers. Um, we have to be adaptive. Um, as my friends Heather McGowan and uh, Chris Chipley say in their book, The, the Adaptation Advantage, we, we have to develop the skill set around being continually adaptive. You know, I, I say in one of my courses on LinkedIn Learning, um, there's no such thing anymore as um, change management. It's all become managing change. So we must be continually adaptive. Uh, we have to use creative problem solving to solve these problems, especially becoming more creative when we're distributed and remote. Um, this is what's going to keep us ahead of robots and software. And then finally, we've got to do it with empathy. We've got to remain connected and linked to our coworkers, to our customers, to solving the problems that we need to um, to be able to continually create the value um, that our organizations create. So individuals, I'm going to give you just a couple of quick thoughts and then uh, point you to a couple of resources. So number one, back up to the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, number two, there's a whole work rhythm, um, alternating rhythms that we have in our lives and we're working together in the same physical space. You have to design those new work rhythms, but try to make sure that they're continually alternating. Don't just stare at your screen all day, get up and move around, get outside the house. Um, you've got much more flexibility now in your work times. So you don't have to be completely locked into the physical meetings that you used to have. It's increasingly important, and Charlene talked about trust and the, the importance of being able to continually reinforce new ways to be able to connect with others. That's how we trust, is that personal connection. Um, it's important to not only try to trust others and to, to trust them that they're doing their work, that they're they're doing their best to try to solve the problems in front of them, but, but also to be trustworthy ourselves. And then finally, as many people have said on the chat thread, we've we've got to stay connected. We've got to stay engaged. It's very, very lonely uh, when suddenly we become isolated. Um, there's a great book um, called uh, Remote uh, by the authors of uh, the, the, the founders of uh, the Basecamp Collaboration Software, 37 Signals. A Plural site has a great remote work guide um, that I think would be very useful as a lot of techniques. And then they've also got a free course uh, calling Making Work From Home Work For You um, that you might want to check out. So. That's for individuals. Now, what about organizations? Well, I think in the same way that we can talk about a mindset shift, um, a COVID shift and the way we work as individuals, uh, we, we got to do the same thing in how we collaborate with each other and how we think about just what an organization is. You know, we, we built organizations in this era and this shift to industrial and post-industrial economies. And we have this place-based model of mass production <laughs> initially of products and then eventually of information. Um, and, uh, and, and we created these, these constructs called big cities with, with commutes. And, uh, and then we, we tried to mass customize the problem of trying to uh, co collaborate in different work. Um, and we simply replicated a lot of those same processes and how we, how we process information and work together. And so what we did is we created this thing that I call a box, you know, and inside the box is a hierarchy. There's, you know, as, as uh, my friend Peter Diamandis says, there's abundance outside the box and there's, there's scarcity inside the box. And, uh, you know, typically just tr traditional employees and sort of that one use case for work. Well, we're going through a world of exponential change. And this isn't just in the, in the COVID shift. It's also in 
the fact that we've got all these non-traditional ways in which people are working. We've got everything from temporary workers to remote workers, gig workers, online platforms, online communities, mentorships, apprenticeships. Well, the box is no longer sufficient. It's no longer able to be able to house all these tremendous skills and capacities in different work cases. So I say we have to shift to a new model, which I call the network, capital N and capital W. This is how we need to think about how we work, especially when we're more distributed, is there's no hard edges to the organization. Um, there's a wide range of different skills and people that can help us to solve the problems of the organization. As we go through the COVID shift, once we uh, the, our world starts to right itself and the collective madness starts to subside, we're going to have a period where we're going to need to figure out how we're going to involve more and more people in economic benefit because right now we're, we're suddenly, you know, we're shutting down a lot of the economic processes by which we all make money and, and, uh, and have productive lives. And so we're going to have to leverage this much more flexible model of what an organization is to continually involve a wide range of people in helping to solve the problems of the organization. I've got a number of techniques I talk about for managers, but basically it's to rethink the, pro the, the, the role of the team. Um, and again, Charlene was talking about some of the things we need to do around communication. I want to talk about sort of the core purpose, which is, you know, a team has a common purpose. Um, they've got a coordinated effort in what they're doing uh, and they hold themselves mutually accountable for results. And then I always say then they dynamically bind around problems. And uh, in, in this era where we're more distributed in our work, it's critical to think about how you define the problem that you're solving. Every time you get on a video call, with your coworkers, that's a great way to start. <laughs> what is the problem that we're solving here? And try to be as efficient as possible so you can then move on to the next problem. So, and uh, if you look at uh, the folks at Buffer have a great way of thinking about this is we went from the sort of office-based, you know, the people that were solving the problem were all in front of each other. And then you start to move along this uh, slider. Now you've got maybe some home options, letting people work from home every now and then. Then you've got one or more workers that are remote but are in the same time zone and now they're in multiple time zones and now you've got nomadic workers and you know everybody's very flexible and so depending upon the kind of work kind of organization that you have you're moving along this slider and we suddenly you know when we hit the, the reset button we suddenly all became distributed teams and um, I think it's important for us to continually think of the ways that we can leverage that process and be able to build much more flexible work environments to be able to continually manage our distributed work. Just some ideas um, for that distributed team and for the ways we can sort of set the reset button for the organization. First off, help uh, teams within the organization to redefine around those problems to be solved. Secondly, um, I know there was some question somebody had uh, of Charlene about uh, teaching and learning. Uh, my great friend Esther Wojcicki, um, who wrote the book uh, Moonshots in Education, uh, she talks about some great techniques for doing that. It turns out they're very useful as well for thinking about rethinking the manager's role. Um, she talks about going from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. And this is really what the role and opportunity for the manager is. No longer this, as Charlene was saying, the person with the answer, but the person with all the best questions. I think it's also critical as we as we go through this uh, this sort of recovery uh, from the COVID shift. How do we rethink location? How do we not replicate these same challenges that we've created by being so place based that when we get these uh, resets, it's very difficult for us to be able to adapt? I haven't talked at all about how technology can be useful, about how AI can help us to develop our own superpowers. Um, one thing I want to caution is we automate more and more tasks. And of course, you know, when we go through this kind of reset, we're going to have an impetus to try to automate more and more tasks. Um, I, I want to urge decision makers to think about how to make that as inclusive work as possible, not just to, quote unquote, free up workers with AI and robotic process automation uh, to make sure they have new work. It's not, uh, you know, 100 percent freed up worker is called unemployed. So uh, let's not do that. And then finally, build processes for training for adaptability. How do we help people to continually not think of this as some change management process, but continually managing change? Um, and uh, you know, the, the the Bible on this is John O'Doohan's a Distributed Teams book. He's got a ton of great techniques. I've also got a course on LinkedIn Learning about developing adaptive managers. But the basic premise is 
Um, if you go to John's blog at odoin.com, you'll see he's actually got a blog specifically about how to go through this kind of adaptation to distributed work. Um, and as Shirley was saying, it's very important to think of this as distributed work, not remote work as in we're remote from each other. I've got the remotest idea how we're gonna, we're gonna figure all this out. Um, it's actually that we're distributed, that, that th these are continually shifting work contents. And we have to think of this as the new normal. Um, if you need, if you're an organization leader or an HR and you need um, documents or policies to help you to sort of work this through, draft policies, uh, srhrm.org. Sherm.org has a lot of great resources um, to be able to use. Um, so we've talked about individuals, organizations. I want to talk about communities. Um, and, and we tend to ignore an awful lot of this when we talk about the future of work and we talk especially about uh, distributed work is, is you know, communities we know, you can see looking around, you know, the, the impact of this uh, reset and this isolation on your community, on workers, on people who do not have the capacity to be able to work from remote. What are the ways we can think about how we can ensure that we are building an, a set of inclusive solutions? What, once we've gone through this isolation period, we're going to go through a process of reconnecting well, there's a whole bunch of people that that are not, it's not easy for them to reconnect. If you look at this chart that Bloomberg put together, um, on the, the, the low end to the right is is scale, is we, uh, wages, scale. Um, and it's actually the jobs that pay some of the lowest that are the hardest to work from remotely. These are the people that are on the front lines. They have to continue working through this era, or if they can't, then they suddenly have huge economic challenges. So, so it's the people that make more money typically, the people that can work more remote that are, you know, these are high class problems that we're dealing with. They're still challenging, but we still have the opportunity to generate a paycheck. And there's a lot of people that are not going to have that same capacity. And so as we, we recover from the COVID reset, what are the things that we can do to continually reinvest in making those connections in our communities. Um, and remember that, that there's actually two kinds of problems. Um, you know, so I talked a lot about that work is our human skills applied to task to solve problems. Those are the problems that we choose, but they're also problems that choose you. Um, you didn't choose to be um, homeless. You didn't choose to be handicapped. Um, to uh, be uh, uh, subject to war, to be a migrant, to be a refugee. There, there's tons of problems in the world that choose you. And, those, and there are people that have, those problems have chosen them in our communities. What are the ways we can build a very inclusive set of processes in, in building strategies around how we make for more inclusive work? So here's some, some examples for you. If you're an organizational leader, Help your organization to become more flexible. Require workers to remote work from remote for uh, once a week when they can, depending upon their work, so that they can continually build this um, this flexible tissue of being able to continually adapt. Whenever you can, hire distributed workers. Don't just focus on what I think of as the dystopian future, uh, where some other speakers were talking about. We might have 80% of all the humans on the planet in big city. That doesn't sound like a great future to me. Hire from people in remote areas and leave them in place. Um, and also hire non-traditional backgrounds. Look for the people that have been affected. Look for the people that have the transferable skills that might help you to solve the problems of your organization. And, um, and think about those are the people that you hire as we, as we go through the process of, of rebuilding from the COVID shift. So I've talked about individuals, organizations, and communities. Now let's talk about countries. Um, let's talk about how we think about this collectively. Um, so my, my old friend, Clay Shirky, uh, John Adun reminded me, he's got this great quote. Um, it isn't about technology at the end of the day, as much as at Singularity University, we talk about exponential technologies, as much as Ray and Peter help us to understand all of the ways that we can leverage these exponential technologies. At the end of the day, it's about new behavior. It's how we act differently, and we act differently when we think differently. And so um, this, this, this reconnection process, we can do in a way that involves everybody, that ensures that we have broadly beneficial futures of work, or it can ensure that we actually have a bunch of people that are isolated. So 
One way I encourage people to step back and think during these times of profound change is to answer just two very basic questions. In 10 years, what will we wish we had done today? When we're looking back in 10 years, how will we be saying to ourselves we did the right things? Uh, running to the grocery store and buying all the toilet paper you possibly can might not be the kind of thing you look back on with with all of the best views of your, your prior self, but, but to think of the ways that we think of how we're all continually working together, collaborating to create that more positive future. And then if we're successful, how will we know? What are the sniff tests? What are the results we're gonna look for when we've built that more inclusive future, um, when, we're, when we're trying to ensure that we all have the, 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 the in place and the distributed work that we all need to be able to thrive. So. Here's a couple of suggestions. Um, we need to figure out what are the policies as countries, as regions, as a global workforce, how do we help people to continually find or create meaningful, well-paid work? How do we create the policies that can reduce the friction, increase access? Because we know that there's going to be a ton of people that are going to need to either create new work or are going to need to be able to build port, what I call portfolios of work, where work is gonna come from a range of different sources. Uh, we need to change the paradigm around learning. Um, we need to continually figure out the ways that we can have access to lifelong learning resources so that we can all continually solve the problems of tomorrow. And, um, and I, wanna, I wanna suggest a model for this. So when you're young and you first start working, um, there's one only one question normally when you sort of fall into the work box, um, uh, unprepared, uh, is how can I make money? Is what are the ways that I can, I can actually, you know, uh, feed myself, feed my family, put a roof over my head. But after a while, you start to realize that there's an opportunity to actually do things well. <laughs> if, you get, if you do something okay, you get paid a certain amount of money. If you do things well, you get paid a lot more. So then it becomes uh, the learning for many of us is what you do, what you get paid for and what you can do well. Now, um, some people stop there. But as my father found with What Color Is Your Parachute, if you help people to understand that they have superpowers, they have unique skills to allow them to solve the problems of tomorrow, well, then there's work that you love. There's work that you can do that, that you feel motivated by. And then some people stop there, but in a world of, constant change where many, many people have problems that have chosen them. Many people have the, pot, the opportunity to be able to figure out what does the world need. And so this, I think, is a model for a fulfilled life, is what you get paid for, what you do well, what you, could, what you love doing, and what the world needs. And it just so happens that this is the Japanese practice of Ikigai. And, um, and so, so this is where I think we all have an opportunity to go through that mindset shift is um, if, if we're in Silicon Valley, there's a stack. Uh, many of us move up the stack in our careers. And eventually we think, oh, well, we make lots of money. Well, then eventually we'll do what the world needs. Well, young people are coming out of, of school and they're doing exactly the opposite. They're saying, what does the world need? If I do that, that's what I'm going to love. If I love it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get good at it. And if I get good, at it, I'm going to get paid for it. And so this is a way to hit the reset button in what we think of in terms of the, the world of work that we all want to build. Um, also a chance to do what I call for the annual career checkup and make sure that you have actually thought about this model in your own life. Um, you know, there's a great chance as, we, as we're going through this pause period to do some of that thinking. Um, it's also um, it's also a great chance to think of you know what we think of as dangerous opportunities. This is actually the Chinese character for crisis, uh, we shui, which is um, dangerous opportunity. Um, unfortunately, when we see danger, we tend to narrow down to who we think of as us. So we think of the concentric circles as just being family and friends. Um, but but I'm, I'm urging you, I think, to think about what the world needs. Um, and, and we need to move beyond it to continually think of the inclusive processes where we're helping the people who, um, who uh, problems have chosen them. Uh, we're thinking of all the inclusive ways that we can think of this as an opportunity to build more inclusive futures of work. And, and as I say, to ensure that there's no human left behind. 
So as I said, uh, go to tbulls.com and see a bunch of these links um, on my website. And um, and now I think I'm going to unshare the screen and uh, I'm happy to um, run through some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I think that is a, that's a really good slide to leave leave up if you uh, if you oh, have the space. Oh no 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 you're fine you're oh, fine. Sorry, I just watch it. <laughs> is there a, did you, I couldn't I couldn't remember did you have a short link for people to grab uh, or download your slides? Yeah, just go to gballs. G sorry gballs.com. Just go and you'll see. Yeah, just look at reading materials on gballs.com. It's the easiest way. Gballs.com. So. Yeah, g b o l s g b o l l e s dot com. Sorry. <laughs> I think I got it right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. I there were multiple moments where I was like, "Gary's got more to say, doesn't he? He has more to say." And I was like, "Oh, now now we're going to communities, and now we're going to, to, to countries." Yeah, so I I just absolutely loved it. Very let's uh, let's take some questions from some folks. So the top one comes from Wendy, and she asks, "As the future of work is rapidly changing from the industrial model, uh, what do you see as some of the most valuable skills that we should be teaching our kids in the future?" So I always ask, uh, it's a great question. So I'm always asked by parents around around the world, um, well, two, two different use cases, young kids and then kids sort of at that inflection point, you know, 15 to 18 and then beyond. So with young kids, I always say, um, if I've seen any sort of uh, so, uh, consistent characteristic for kids that I think are are gonna do just great, it's um, it's that they're all in on something, you know, the. Uh, with my, my my son Christian, when he was uh, when he was young, it was it was bugs, it was insects. Um, you know, if you'd asked him when he was two and a half, it was going to be an entomologist someday. He would have said, "Well, I am an entomologist." Um, so so and and but then it's not bugs; it's something else, right? And so what you want is uh, you want to continually encourage your kid to go all in on something, and it's math through bugs, reading through bugs, stories through bugs, whatever it is. And then it's dinosaurs, and then it's bugs. It doesn't matter what it is. So if you incur continually encourage them to have those passions. Um, and then when the kids are older, parents often ask me, especially at that 15 to 18 point, um, how will my kid be happy and successful? So my first response is drop successful. Uh, we're following the old rules of work. We used to think that, oh, getting going to the right school and getting the right degree and getting the right job and the right field, that's too many rights. You know, all those many rights make a wrong. It's, that's our model. And, and kids today, they've got a portfolio of work. They're coming out of school and they're, they're, they're yeah, sure, they might have a day job, but they're driving for Uber and they're working on a startup with their friends. And, you know, this is a portfolio just like your investment counselors to just get to distribute risk. It's a rational response to an exponentially changing world. And so, so I, I, I come back to those four skills in general, problem solvers who are adaptive, creative with empathy. So if you teach your kids those four things, you stop solving the problems for them. They fall down. Help them, let them get up themselves. They they just solve the problem. Let them figure it out themselves, um, and help them to adapt and do it uh, with creative uh, problem solving and especially with empathy. They're going to be just fine. And those are also the skills that we just you, you can't ever be too good at. You know, you could you're we're constantly uh, improving or sharpening that axe, whatever the analogy yeah. you want. Um, those four things. I I could not agree more. All right, let's grab. One more. Actually, we've got time for more than one more. Um, it's hard to get. Oh, okay, here's a good question. So for folks that might be working for ho from home for the first time that have kids, do you have any tips for helping um, that they can use to help maybe others understand the challenges that come with having kids at home? And I'll, and I'll piggyback on that with... Um, the folks at Basecamp, you, you mentioned them earlier, they shared publicly this uh, uh, memo that they sent out to their company today that was basically like, listen, we know what's going on. We see you. We know your challenges. What's most important is your family and your health. And so if that means that you're working part-time, full-time, quarter-time, whatever, do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, but what, what are some of your general advice for parents that are at home right now with kids? So I want to give, I'm going to put those in two different contexts. So what you can do with the kids yourself and, and then with coworkers. So the first thing is um, even, uh, well, not, not going to do that if they're, if they're still in a stroller, but even with young kids, make them part of the solution. Help them to be problem solvers. Help them to understand, um, you know, that mommy and daddy, we've got, you know, these, we, uh, we've got these, this sort of new world that we're living in. And uh, we've got these work things to do. Well, help me to figure out how I can do this. How can I set up my work environment? How can I figure out the times of day that I can work the best? 
How can we make sure we've got the times where we're together and we're always doing the things that are fun together, but how can we make sure that we get our work done too? And, and then what are you going to do while I'm getting my work done? What, what, what can you do that could be supporting the work of the work of the family, but still be fun for you? Um, make them part of the process. And, um, and, and do, I do sort of daily uh, rounds during the, the dinner table. How did it work for you today? What problems did you solve? Oh, oh, what new problems do you want to try to solve tomorrow? So that they, you know, you're, you're encouraging all the skills that we were just talking about. And then with coworkers, um, you know, Charlene, I think mentioned a couple of the, the sort of techniques around um, uh, the, the process of uh, communication. So think about starting each meeting with a quick go round. What's the one thing you're dealing with in your life right now, your personal life? So we can just make sure we're all, we all have empathy. And it doesn't mean we're going to solve your problem for you. It doesn't mean that you're bringing your problem to just, you know, to tell us all to, to, to complain about it. It's that each of us have challenges we're trying to deal with. I've got a you know, 93-year-old mother in a nursing home. I've got to figure out how I'm going to keep the kids focused on their schoolwork, whatever that is. And then if, you know, with coworkers, just to create that, that uh, fabric of empathy on a regular basis, um, even with senior leaders in an organization, I guarantee you're still dealing with those same challenges. For sure. And I, I think to summarize there, what you're, um, at least what I took out of it was, I love the idea of do it together. There's so many ways that you can get other people involved right now that you might not be thinking of, right? Where it's, well, normally I would just set up my workspace and go to work, but doing it with your kids or doing it with your spouse or talking to your friends about how they're setting up. There's just, there's just so many opportunities to collaborate with others. Um, if you take an extra pause to think about it. And then yeah. the second piece is just being open with what you're dealing with. Um, it is such a, a superpower it, being able to put that vulnerability into your, your day-to-day -day life. You can have your kids go research, go talk to their friends. What are they doing to help their parents? To make sure that they're doing the you know the the work of the family and the work that needs to be done so and it's the same thing with coworkers. is what resources have you found is there one place you have found that can help me to figure out like what i'm going to do to make sure my kid is is able to, to um stay engaged with his uh with his his or her um uh, fellow students for example you know um, your coworkers should be great resources for that too yeah for sure so let's go to uh carlos's question Next, uh, he is asking about the best way or the best approach to handle fear of change. Um, you know, when a company is trying to shift from the mindset of, you know, I have to see you in your seat to be able to work that to know that you're working versus when you when I can't see you, what do I do? What can people do to help their organization yeah. make that shift? So so first off, I, 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 I blame us for coming up with a model where we've taught a manager that they need to be the sage on the stage as opposed to the guide on the side. You know, we, we failed. We failed uh, the manager of the world, so so we need to figure out what's the what are the incentives. I mean, so um, I actually have been spending a lot of time um, working on a, a book on the future of work, and um, and I t there's a, there's a whole there's a ton of neuroscience that helps us to understand just the way our minds work around risk and trust. So um, one of the most important things is to come back to this basic of the problems to be solved. So the, what, what any manager has is essentially their, um, their feet are being held to the fire that the work of the group is being done. It's, it's un unfortunately we fall in love with the process, the steps that we feel we have to go through to solve those problems without stepping back and really rethinking what the, what the problem is. And Charlene's right in that there's a ton of processes that are really, really important to help us, especially when we communicate. But in terms of the problem solving itself, that's something that a manager can actually do Rather than starting a meeting and listing out, okay, here's the stuff I've got for you to do, the manager can say, okay, now here's the three problems I think we need to solve. You, you tell me when you think you, between you, you can come up with the solutions for this. And then, okay, great. Three days, great. I'm going to come back in three days. And that is dialing down a whole bunch of the control for the manager, and it's dialing up the perception of risk. Make the risk explicit. So help the workers to be able to understand, OK, so if we don't hit our deadlines, then here's the critical path we're on for these other people. Now let's make sure that we're actually beating that deadline so that we don't have the risk, you know, create the risk for others. And so that is nothing but a, a process of communication. Yep. It's amazing how how much communication or how, how often it just comes down to communication. <laughs> so if yeah. you don't don't tell somebody, you don't share it, they don't know, and it just creates that those unnecessary challenges that we come across. Yeah. I've got an exercise that I suggest, I'll just tell you really quickly. 
uh, and you probably won't do this during during the, the COVID reset, but maybe you will. Um, your manager, you tell your, your workers, all right, I want you all together to use a virtual whiteboard or a Google Doc, and I want you to list out all the problems that you solve. And then I want you to list out all of the, the tasks you perform to solve those problems. Then I want you to list out all the skills you have. And then I want you together in a virtual team, distributed work, I want you to rejigger all that. I want you to figure out whose skills are going to be used to solve what problem. Because now we've had to re do a reset. We're doing a rethink of all the ways we're solving these problems. That exercise alone as a manager is going to help you to be able to step back, you know, some of the control needs. If you once once you see the ways that workers, I mean, they're so much smarter about solving these problems than we ever give them credit for. Um, to, to let them come back to you with the ways that they're going to adapt their work processes in, in this era. Absolutely. Uh, let's go, we'll kind of stay in this zone of uh, workspaces, actually. So Claudia asks, uh, do you have any tips or recommendations for how to how to think about the different spaces that you have in your house? Like workspace, mm -hmm. living space, children's space, children let off steam space. <laughs> so um, I, I don't I don't want to say, you know, the, well, well, let me put it this way. Um, th there's a there's a range of different opportunities that each of us have. Um, you know, if you're if you're living in a you know a studio apartment versus you know large large home or something in between, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like a broken record on this. First off, bring your kids into the process. Like, let them understand that's a problem to be solved. Um, let them understand noise levels um, and uh, the and and how clean or not things need to be. Let them understand there's times uh, and and there need to be signals to be sent. If you're on a video conference and the you know kids run run through doing a game of hide and seek, then maybe that's okay and maybe that's not. You know, so you've got to figure out what that process is. Um, I, I I'm a big fan of letting the kids put up signs, put up labels, let them mark the territory of those different zones, and let them mark your work zone. You know, so so if there's a place you need to be able to have even even it's just the couch in the living room where you need to be able to especially have a cone of silence or a zone where you can get work done at particular periods of time, figure out what that process is between you and uh, and put and put up labels so that that you that, that the space is actually clearly defined. That's great. Let's let's end on something maybe a little bit more personal. Can you tell us about what is it? What is your home? Uh, space look like and and what is life <laughs> under under shelter in San Francisco like right now for you? Well, so it's so 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 because I've been doing this for 15 years, my wife and I we're in a we're in a, um, in a, 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 a same rented flat in San Francisco for 24 years. Um, so uh, so we're actually in what used to be called the fainting room, and it's a tiny little room with no door. Um, where in Victorian area, women supposedly went when they had the vapors, whatever that was, and and um, and uh, relaxed in the afternoon. And uh, so we're sort of knee 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 to knee, um, and uh, and then the living space, you know, is is sort of behind me. So and uh, I'm the more casual type, and my wife is much much better at uh, staying organized. So so I'm 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 the entropy, um, but um, but but we we've got a it, it's it's a great set of alternating rhythms for us because we've been doing this for quite some time and and now i can't do what i normally do which is to go out and in uh, in the city and and have a lot of meetings and coffee shops and that sort of thing but now we have virtual coffee so, so we built that you know we got to build more and more of that into into our daily routines fantastic well any any parting thoughts you want to share with the group so i just want to come back to the opportunity for each individual for everybody that's listening here is for you, for your work, for what you're doing in your career, think of this as a, as a chance, even if you're taking five minutes or, or five days um, to do that sort of career checkup. What, what are the things, you know, th think of Ikigai and think of what is important for you in each of the different aspects of that portfolio. And is it time to, to simply double down on what you're doing now or is it time to think of a reset? Um, this this is what we see coming out of these eras is this is the opportunity is to think about how to go through that process of adaptation and um, and reinvention and and especially then if you feel that you have you're on top of that then uh, each one teach ten <laughs> help help two other people help ten other people 
to go through the same process themselves because we're we're all in this together. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. And uh, I think we'll be doing more of these in the future. So hopefully, hopefully you'll join us again. Uh, great. Thanks a lot. All right. We'll see you, Gary. I appreciate it, Adam. All right. So that is uh, the most of our chunk on remote work, distributed work. Um, we definitely will be creating content um, on that moving forward. So hopefully y'all will come, come back and join in. We're going to switch gears and go to education next um, with Joss Dirks, who should be joining us here in a couple minutes um, to talk about how we can make the most of learning in a global pandemic. So that will be <clears throat> what is up. Let me do a couple quick housekeeping slides for those of you that might just be joining us for the first time today. There we go. I swear, no matter how many times I do this, I'm still not super fast at that swap and screen thing. Uh, the team just posted all these links so you can click on them directly, but some great resources to continue to engage with us. Facebook group, uh, share some ideas um, on the Be Innovative platform. We've got six challenges up. We'll be sharing out the results of those um, in the next couple of days once it all wraps. YouTube playlist, uh, all sessions are recorded. You can watch them at any point in time in Crowdcast. That's where you're at right now. Just click on schedule, pick any session. You can go back and see them. And you can also go um, to our resources page, uh, su.org slash COVID-19. We link out to all the sessions. They will be up on YouTube as well in 24 hours if you need them in a different language or just prefer to share them um, in a different way. But feel free to take screenshots of your favorite um, sessions or slides, uh, share them out. I think the, the more we can get this information out to the world, the better. So we definitely encourage sharing. Um, if you didn't hear yesterday, um, we are doing a follow-on event with EXO and XPRIZE where we're going to be going a lot deeper on the business implications and applications of what we're talking about here, uh, less COVID-19 itself. We thought all of that should be free and available, but um, though, how is this going to impact your business um, ecosystem communities and what you can do about it? So if you want to do more workshop uh, type stuff, more connections, go to exoworld.live slash SU um, to get signed up for that here in about a month. And then uh, we are also starting to launch some podcasts here at Singularity University, and we're so excited to partner um, with Chris at the at our Singularity U Nordic partner. Um, he's going to be talking about corporate innovation and interviewing a lot of the experts around our ecosystem on what's happening in corporate innovation. And I know that uh, future of work, distributed work, and teams will be there. So if you want to get early access today, um, it's, we're going to be releasing it here in a couple of days. But if you want to start listening to that now sunordic.org slash podcast, um, and you can download it there. All right, that is it for my updates. Uh, but thanks everybody for being here and I will see you in a couple minutes.